for coming out in the cold. I appreciate it. You're rewilding by going out in the cold. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't general, I don't read from my books. Maybe I'll read you a few lines because I don't want to put you to sleep. Um, so if it's okay because we're a smaller group, which is fine, I was going to just tell you a little about why I did the book and some ideas that I've been thinking about um, since the book, since I wrote it and came out. Okay, the publisher I work with is really very good in the sense that we we did the proofs in August and the book really came out in October. So a lot of publishers you do proofs in August 2014 and the book comes out ten months or a year later and um, you want to make changes. So we were making changes right up to the end, and I think he had enough of me. <laughs> um, so, so a little about what, um, the book. Um, it's kind of a personal history, but I started writing it about five years ago, and and I thought it was going to be really easy to write, and it wasn't. It was really hard to write, and then I was doing some other books and some papers. And I just, I should, probably shouldn't tell you this because I know there's authors. So I just kept putting it off. And my, my editors were fine. You know, they really, he said, you know, do, do it when you're ready. Um, and then I tried to finish it. And then I did a book last year, I know some of you have, called Why Dogs Hump and Bees Get Depressed. And he thought that that would be a good book to put out before this one came out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I've been thinking about the idea of rewilding for a really long time, and the, the history of rewilding is a very, um, it's a simple one. It, conservation biologists back in the 90s um, talked about the notion of rewilding, and they were applying it mostly to carnivores, and it was uh, basically to build corridors for animals like the Yukon to Yucatan corridor where there'd be overpasses and underpasses and animals could basically move without human animals bothering them. So it really dealt with corridors and interconnections so that they could have long routes of, um, for travel. And the name, uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of David Foreman. Anybody here? You should read all his books. He's, um, He's, a, he's just unbelievable. I mean, he's a crack conservationist and writes great books, and he runs the Rewilding Institute in um, Albuquerque. Yeah. So he wrote a, and there's a man named Michael Soule, some of you may have heard of him. He's basically considered to be the father of conservation biology. Um, so all, this really great group of people were involved in the original Rewilding projects. So what dawned on me once, and it was probably over a bunch of beers or something like that, but I started flipping around the idea of rewilding and the notion of corridors, and something came to me um, that we need to rewild ourselves. You, know, you can rewild the wild. And what came to me was that we need to rewild ourselves because we're basically unwilded. And, and so, I started thinking of the notion of undoing the unwilding. So it's like a negative times a negative becomes a positive. <laughs> and then I started thinking about what the sources of unwilding are. So one is education. So I have a, I, um, a chapter here called Rewilding Education, trying to make education more humane, for example. Because when you think about it, um, kids more and more, I think, too, are unwilding from they're basically unwilded from the day they go to school. They have to sit in chairs. They don't want to. They're squirming all over the place. If, if they don't behave, what's one thing they lose? They, they lose their free time outside. They have to sit in front of computers. So one way we could you know, get un, undo the unwilding would be in education. That, that's where I would focus, if I had one area to focus. The other is media. Media is constantly misrepresenting so for, you know, so for example, if there's some horrific event, they'll say the people acted like animals. I mean, of course they did. I mean, humans are animals. So I mean, it's kind of redundant. But, but you know, we sort of sometimes place ourselves above and separate from other animals. Um, 
And so I started thinking about how people could make a difference in, in a personal, sort of transformative way. And what I came up with was just this idea that if we rewild ourselves in our hearts and we let our hearts drive us into action, there'll be somehow these connections between the heart and the brain. And it, and it really turns out there are connections. I mean, neurally and you know, hormonally and all that. So that, that's really where it came from. You know, just that whole notion of rewilding as being um, a transformative um, personal process. And then what I was thinking about, so this is really, this is hot off the press. You know, the minute you publish something, you go, oh God, how could I have not thought of this? Um, which is great, because that's why I like what I do, because there's always room to do more. So, did anybody here go to the Europa con con um, concert? <laughs> Conference, yeah. Thinking about music. Conference on radical trans, what is it? Radical, radical compassion. compassion. Right, so Dan Siegel was there. And bef he gave a talk. I don't know if you know who Dan Siegel is. He's written lots of wonderful books on, on all aspects of behavior. What was his latest one called? Do you remember? I just can't. I, I'm just not going to remember it. But he's a very eclectic thinker. And so I had dinner with him right before he gave his talk. And we started talking about how we can change human society by developing what we call memes. People know what memes are? You know what genes are? No, I mean, <laughs> genes, G-E-N-E-S. OK, so genes are you know, units of evolution. Memes are cultural units of evolution. So they're ideas that are culturally transmitted from one generation to another or across cultures. So it came to me when I was talking to Dan that rewilding could be a meme. Because what I, 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 what I look at it as is if everyone in this room does something, it just, in a contagious way, spills over to other people doing good things. So I, that's an idea that I've really been playing with. Because the thing about rewilding is that it incorporates human animals, non-human animals, and their homes. It's not exclusive only to humans. And because the only way you can rewild out in the world is to reconnect with other humans, other animals, and their homes. Does that make sense? You can stop me any time if you have questions. Um, I'm not going to ramble on forever. But but I'm going to demand that you have questions and help me develop ideas. Um, so the other thing that came to me, and, and it's been coming to me for a really long time, and it's not a new idea, is that as human beings, we need to have a lot more humility in the way in which we interact in the world. So the one thing we need to do is make fewer of us. I was at a meeting in, um, where was I? Los Angeles. That's California? Yeah, right there. <laughs> um, in Burbank, there's a group called the Performing Animal Welfare Society. And they had a meeting just this past weekend I was, I was there. And a lot of it focused on elephants, elephant conservation. It's really what they do. It was formed by a woman named Pat Derby. She had been an actress and was very upset about the way animals were treated in entertainment. So she. I mean, she's a fireball. I, when I first met her, I thought, now this is one person I don't want to get on the wrong side of. <laughs> Short little lady, you'd see her and you'd think she would just be, you know, a marshmallow. No, she's, she's really tough. And so she founded this society. And when we were talking out there, the first thing, you know, talking about how elephants are being decimated in the wild, there was a woman there named Joyce Poole who has done a lot of really groundbreaking work on, on elk behavior ecology in Amicelli. But the one thing that came up at this meeting and every meeting I've been to recently is the, what's the major problem that spills down into everything? Population. Overpopulation. Pop yes, there's, there's too many of us. It really is. Population and climate change. By the way, climate's changing. I. I <laughs> I heard on the, I, I was uh, probably on the TV when I was flipping channels. It's probably Fox News, actually. Um, oh. But somebody was saying, you see how cold it is now? Global warming? <laughs> you know the difference between climate and weather, of course. Um, and the other was climate change. 
for which we're responsible. I mean, I, I, I don't think one has to just be on the left of the aisle or a Democrat to think that a lot of climate change, or most of it, is anthropogenic. Okay. So that's another thing we talked about is, you know, what role could rewilding do, play in that, in sort of population control? Not that it's going to be influential, but if think about it, we're the only animal who basically out-eats ourselves, over-consumes, you know, um, when I was writing this book, I could only find one example, and I can't remember the species. It could have been capuchin monkeys. I can't remember the species, but only one example of an animal, non-human animal, who's actually eaten itself out of house and home. Just one. And you know, so once again, um, we can do it. And why can we do it? Because we have access to alternative sources of food and everything else. You know, to live. So I think part of rewilding is, is in the future having fewer of us. And just today, a paper um, an article came across, I was going to say my, my desk, my screen. Um, there's no more desks on there. <laughs> um, an article came across my screen, and it was a model and some work that's been done on global population. And it was a very, it, it was not a hopeful article that it's going to be very hard. They're thinking maybe by the end of this century, people will get it, you know, make fewer of us. So one way of rewilding would be, you know, having one kid, you know, if you're going to have any. Um, and population is, is really population control and trying to deal with climate change is really, you know, high on the agenda because it spills down into everything else that's going on in the world. You know, one of, and one of the reasons that so many populations of animals are really in such deep trouble is because they're losing critical habitat. There's no place for them to go. So another thing of rewilding, you know, I'm just, I was trying to think of novel ways to approach this, would be to preserve habitat for animals who you might want to reintroduce in the wild later on, or their descendants. Because what happens, of course, if it's an area where there are no animals. Developers don't wait. You can't say, look, in 25 years, we want to put elephants back here, or we want to reintroduce a bird or other things where um, mammal species. They don't wait. You know? So these are things that I think we need to get into the brains of youngsters who are going to, in, you know, in the future, make a difference. Because one of the sort of, it's not a morbid thought, because I'm really an optimist, but but I was doing the kids event a couple, probably a month ago, and I was thinking, what's the world going to be like for them in 20 years? Not, not 70 years, but in 20 years. And I know people get really upset you know, when people throw the word that what we're doing now isn't sustainable. It's not good for our health, blah, 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 blah. But it really isn't. We, at some point, we will, we may not run out totally, but at some point, we're going to run out of resources critical resources. We, we, we really, really are. So, so you know, that's another idea that I was coming out of. It, but what I was thinking about is part of rewilding would be to have us accept our non-human animal nature. There's nothing bad about it. So for example, and a lot of people don't know this, the most recent research on social behavior across mammals and other animals, but I know the mammals the best, shows that more than 90% of their behavior is what we call pro-social or positive, cooperative. They display compassion and empathy for one another, more than 90%. This isn't to say that animals don't fight with one another and on occasion harm one another. But so when animals are used as sort of a justification for war, conflict, it's really a misuse of them. I mean, that would be the media. I had a big argument with somebody at a magazine recently because they were talking about all the wars in which chimpanzees engage. There's only been one chimpanzee war that's on record. Um, in the mid to late 70s, there were groups of, there was a group of chimpanzees at Gandhi Street where Jane Goodall worked and they split into two groups. And then one group of, 
I think it was six males, systematically chased down and killed all the males in the other group. And one. But you wouldn't know that when you read popular media or you, 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 know, you watch TV. So another way to, of rewilding, in terms of rewilding the media, is to get them to, to uh, represent animals as they are, as who they are, not what they are. Um, I didn't have it in this book. I had it in another book. I was flying somewhere, and I was reading some proofs for a, either a paper or a book, and, and the woman sitting next to me just said, you know, you know what are you doing? And, and I said, oh, I'm reading proofs. And she said, oh, it seemed like you just got upset about something. And I said, yeah, because every time you run spell check on Word through a manuscript that changes who to it or that to refer to animals. I mean, it happened to me today when I was writing something. Well, it turned out she worked for Microsoft. <laughs> Perfect. I said, look, I'll buy you beer. Let's have a chat. So I told her. And I mean, what she said, of course, was she was sensitive to it. But, you know, in a sense, she basically, I don't, I, well, I can tell you right now, this was four or five years ago, and it happened today. So <laughs> she, she didn't go to Bill Gates or whoever it is and say, we should change it. But that's a huge, huge change when you, ref you know, the words we use to refer to non-human animals. They're whose, they're not what's or that's or it's. So one thing I really like to get, and I try to get young kids to do it all the time, is to refer to animals as who my, the dog who I, with, you know, with whom I live, not that I, I live with. And it always spills over into clothing and food. So it's usually who you're eating or who you're wearing, not what you're eating or what's for dinner. And it's just little terms like that. And, and I'm not, I don't try to be pushy about it. I, I don't. I, I think it's the best message and the best way to deal with people is just throw it out there and let them do what they want. But back, um, I think it was in, just in May or so, I got an email from some people who had come to a talk I gave in Vienna. It was about a year, a year and a half later. And this woman said that five people in the audience had become vegetarians because they started using the word who. So it's little changes. And I'm not, it's not only diet, it's respect for the animals. It's, it's a mountain lion to the cougars who we displace, not why. And I really think that, so part of rewilding and reconnecting with other animals is to refer to them as whom they are. There's, you know, many sentient beings with feelings about who care what happens to them. Any questions? You don't buy this? God, that's baldy. You're you're easy. <laughs> so um, so another thing that I've come up with, and I'll throw this out, because of course I want you to read the book, and I want to just tell you about the whole book. But I came up with some kind of guide for action. See, to me, the bottom line is um, that we all have to do something. So I write for Psychology Today and yesterday, based on the meeting that I went to this weekend, I said, is going to a zoo like buying a car for the following reason. Zoos make claims, makes, zoos make claims that they make large contributions to conservation and education. Okay? The conservation card is a bit tricky because there are a number of zoos that put a lot of money into various animal behavior, behavioral ecology, and conservation projects. Not a, not, not a fraction of what they tell you they do. So I didn't want to play the conservation card, but the education card, OK, is one. So the reason I wrote this article is if you go into, how many people here have gone into a car showroom in the last 10 years? Probably everyone, right? And what happens? There's no car salesman. No, I mean, my friends are car salesmen. I like them. But I mean, they hang over you like you know, a Klingon, right? And, and you can't get rid of them. So if you go into a car showroom and you look at a car, but you don't buy it, functionally, right, it doesn't matter. You didn't buy one. And that's what happens when people go to zoos. The zoo people will say that, well, we educate. Well, you might. There's no doubt that people go to zoos. I bet you a lot of people go to zoos and learn something that they didn't know about some 
animal who is in the zoo. But what do they do with it? I mean, to me, the bottom line in terms of the function of all thing, these things is taking action. You know, do they put money into a conservation project? Do they adopt an animal? Do they do something? Do they go on and become a professor, good Lord? <laughs> I didn't, I'm not doing what I did because I went to zoos, although I did go to zoos when, you know, when I was younger. So, so another way, you know, would be another way in, you know, in, in terms of the rewilding and get people to act. And, and I'm not quite sure how to enact it, so if anybody has any kind of suggestions, would be to have people have to make immediate uh, monetary contributions. Louis Sahoyo, some of you may know him, he was an Oscar-winning director of the Cove, he lives in Boulder, and he had a great idea, he was telling me, that when they show the Cove, I don't think he's done it, they should basically just have, you know, like the Salvation Army collects money around Christmas, that you just have a pot when people leave. People will probably give them, but if they say, no, I'll go home in 20 minutes and go on the web and do it, no, they really don't. It's not a criticism, you know, but they don't. Okay, so, so I came up with this guide for action, and I'll throw it out, and I'm talking about it as a social, media, um, a social movement. I came up with what I called the eight P's of rewilding, and then I added two. The first is being proactive. And it's really important to be proactive. We can't continue to put out fires. We just can't do it. So you don't have to be prescient, and you don't have to be able to see the future. The future is here. We, we know what's going on in terms of populations of animals. We know what's happening in their habitats. And we also know what's happening with a lot of people. Okay, so when I talk about animals, I'm really talking about human animals and non-human animals and all of their homes and habitats. Okay, the rewilding, the rewilding paradigm and meme for me is all living beings. Being proactive, being positive. Um, I'm, I'm positive, and if you saw my email inbox in the morning, you'd wonder why I'm not. Oh, it's another P, Prozac, right? <laughs> I mean, so the stuff that comes into my um, email is, it's brutal sometimes. It really is. But we need to be positive. We need to chip away at the little things that we can do. So a lot of people say, well, in order to do something, what can I do? I don't have money. I'm not famous. I can't do this. Well, you don't have to found a movement or have a lot of money. You can just start right in your own house. You can just start right in your own home and do really good things. Okay? Because my feeling is that compassion and positive things beget compassion and positive things. Just like violence begets violence. Okay, it's just the flip side of the coin. Being persistent, just not giving up. It doesn't mean being a pain, which is another P. This is good, somebody taking notes here because I haven't thought about all the, the P words. But being persistent and really believing in your goal. Really believing that you can have, you can make a difference and not being put off. Just really saying, I want to do it. And part of being persistent, and this came up at this meeting I was at, and I know there are people in the room, this room who have faced the same thing, where naysayers or skeptics try to derail you. And so you have finite time and energy, and if they take away some of that energy, then you have less time and energy to put into whatever project it is you know, that you really want to make a heartfelt difference. So being persistent and picking your battles. So sometimes when I talk about animal emotions, you know, talk about dogs or mammals, you know, mammals in general, we have a lot of data now that, you know, birds are really smart, fish are really smart, they do a really amazing thing. There was just a re report a couple of months ago showing that alligators use tools I mean, you know, when Jane Goodall started her work, it was man the tool maker, you know, not even chimpanzees. And so, um, sometimes when I'm talking, you know, I'll say something about, you know, dogs or other mammals have rich emotional lives. Some, you know, they say, say well, what about mosquitoes? <laughs> and, and I'll say, well, I'm not talking about mosquitoes. I'm talking about dogs. If you want to talk about mosquitoes, maybe we'll talk about mosquitoes. But what happens if you get sucked into an argument like that, 
all of a sudden you're, you're done. You might as well go home because you're not being able to give the time and energy that you need to making the argument that you want to make, say, about dogs or other mammals. Okay, so not getting derailed and really being persistent. Because, and, and in terms of the animal protection movement, the environmental movement, all these movements are just fraught with internal conflict. So another thing is just stop bickering. You know, I mean, there's, there's so few of, I mean, when I say global lust, people I know in here, and I don't know a lot of you, who really are committed to making the world a better place for other people, other animals, and, you know, save their homes. You know, you, look, you, know, you walk around and, you, you know, you go to meetings and you're preaching to the converted. So another thing is getting out and talking to the unconverted. Really just talking to people by example, talking with them, not at them, and then just putting it out there and leaving. You know, that's, that's just, that's, you know, good enough but not using, not misusing your valuable time and energy. I really mean that. And part of it is the internal big room at this meeting um, this past weekend, but at other meetings, and I know some of you have been, you know, at gatherings. It's all of a sudden this, you know, this internal fighting, and then people say, well, why should we listen to you if you all can't agree with one another? So it's okay to agree to disagree. If you have a common goal of making the world a better place, then it doesn't really matter whether you agree on everything. It really matters that you get off your butt and do something. Being patient, um, it's not going to be a gold star at the end of the day. So that persistence and patience really go along with one another. I mean, they really go hand in hand. Just being really patient and um, peaceful. You know, it's something you learn as you grow up when you're a teenager. You're not going to be nice to people with whom you disagree. But the best way to get something going is to be nice. It's a disarming mechanism. Years ago, I took a course in conflict resolution. It's a disarming mechanism. You know, you do really good work. I like the cabinets, but the bathroom's just terrible. <laughs> Stuff like that, you know, and honoring the views of other people. It's hard to do sometimes when somebody's in your face, but it's also disarming when you just don't get sucked into fighting with them. Um, being powerful. There's a lot of power in all of these P's when you're doing the right thing. There's a, there's a lot of power when even people with whom, people who disagree with you know that you're right. You, do, you, you have a lot of power. You really do. It's not misusing it, but you really have power and passion. Um, just picking something in which you're really interested and just going for it. Not having people, you know, I hear people say, how can you spend your time doing that? Well, that's my choice. You know, how do they spend their time doing whatever they want? Being powerful. The other two Ps is being present, which really means focused, and then being playful. So one of the things I, I write about in here, and, I've, um, and it's really kind of dear to my heart, is Psychologists, this came up at the Naropa meeting in, in one session I was in, but I know a lot of other people are talking about it, um, talk a lot about what they call secondary trauma. And it's the trauma that people suffer. A lot of people in the animal rights or animal protection movement suffer from it, people in the environmental movement, and people who work with people who are down and out suffer from it. Secondary trauma, and they burn out. They forget how to play. So I'll tell you what I write in here um, about me is um, I haven't burned out. And it's kind of, sometimes it's surprising, but then what I think about, and I'm being you know, open about it, you can read about it, but it's fun to say, is I, I always say I play hard, I work hard, and I rest hard. I watch crappy movies. <laughs> I, do. I was watching Predator last night for the 15th time. I was. Um, I, read, I like to say I like to watch movies where I can fall asleep, wake up five minutes later, and not miss a beat. <laughs> Nothing heavy, no reality stuff. I like to read novels. Uh, well, maybe I shouldn't call them novels because a novelist would get really upset. I like to read books, like spy books and stuff, where you know if, if you skip a page, it's okay. You, know, you can read odd pages and then even pages. At the end of the day, you kind of know the story. 
But I, but I really mean that. I really like light things when I'm, I like to ride my bike a lot. Um, and I like single malt scotch. <laughs> and I like to stir it with Twizzlers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's out there now. <laughs> But, but no, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a psychologist in town because he was dealing, he's actually dealing with some athletes who burn out. And it's a different sort of burnout sometimes because it's physical, but a lot of it's mental. And it's really leaving your brain behind, just forgetting about what you're doing. By forgetting about it, it doesn't mean that it's not important. What it means is that you can come back the next day and be rekindled. You know, the metaphor, which, or the analogy is so clear, is like running your car. You know, you drive, you fill it with gas. You know, you get hungry, and you eat. And I think what happens is it's really seductive when you're working with beings in need, other people or other animals, to never want to stop. Because that's how much work there is to do out there. For the very few people, relatively few people, who even care about this kind of stuff, you could work 24-7 and just burn out totally by trying to right the wrongs out there. So I think being playful. And my mom, among the very um, last words that she ever said to me before she passed away was, be sure you play a lot. Aww. Yeah. Aww. Who said it loud? Isn't that nice? No, really. It was, it was pretty cool. And my father always used to say, you just have to laugh at yourself. You just can't take yourself all that seriously. You know, you, it doesn't mean that what you do isn't serious. It doesn't mean being alive and being healthy and sentient isn't serious. But at the end of the day, you some, I mean, is there anybody in here who's, has people in here laugh at yourself sometimes? You just go, did I say that or do that? Jeez! <laughs> but it's all part of being light. And my friend Bruce does work in this, says it's like, you know, stepping away from your cortex. It's just letting things go. So when people say, hey, you want to watch this heavy movie tonight? You know, my response is, Jesus, the whole day was a heavy movie. <laughs> I mean, you know, why do I want more of that? So it's so bottom line, but I, I really want to hear from you all, is that, um, well, I don't know if there is a bottom line. The bottom line is that we have to get off our butts everyone who do something. Here's the bottom line for you. It's, a, it's, it's an unpleasant, but it also a pleasant thought. In 1950s, the ratio in this world of the have, I'm going to say the have-nots to the haves was two to one. So I sort of make a little leap and I say, it's the haves who can do something, while the have-nots, which is probably you know, more than 95% of the world's population, by the way, I just don't know where the next meal is coming. So that was two to one. It's been projected in 2050, the, re, the, the ratio of the have-nots to the has, it's going to be six to one. Except in America, because everyone's rich here. So when you think about that, it's pretty, to me it's pretty daunting. The number of problems and situations we're faced with is growing. The number of people relative to those, the number of people who can do something relative to the number who can't do something is shrinking. So you don't need to be Albert Einstein to know that it's more pressure on the people who can do something to do something. And so I kind of use that as a guide. And, and once again, it's, it's anything. I mean, it, it's just anything. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say that. Anything positive. <laughs> right. Um, you know, to do. And, and really reconnecting. And so there's a study, there's a, a field of study called anthrozoology, it's a study of human animal relationships. And one of the findings that's coming out of it across the board, across cultures, is that what happens to non human animals in their homes affects us, our own mental health and well being. So even if someone is motivated, only to take care of themselves. By doing good things, it will, by sort of default, help other people. But I think in the end, and, and this is sort of, not, I don't know if it's a, an urgent call, but I think one of the calls would be that when we realize 
that we are so intimately connected. Part of the rewilding then is making is to make wild again, to become re-enchanted with the world at large, is that one of the outcomes of the process of rewilding is that it'll make it better for ourselves personally. And anything that makes a person feel better is going to spill over into other people. So regardless of you know the motivation that is leading you to, if you will, rewild. Yeah. Um, John Muir saved a lot, or conserved a lot of space in this country, uh, or helped to, by exposing a lot of people to wild land. Mm -hmm. Zoos exposed a lot of people to wild animals. Uh -huh. and of course, in a lot of cases, they do it in exactly the wrong way. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a concept that can preserve the idea of introducing animals from around the world to our children, primarily, I guess, mm -hmm. but to all of us, uh, and still works for the animal kingdom mm -hmm. in, with the exclusion of humans, or, or including humans, I guess. But, but so yes, is, is there a way to do it yeah. other than zoos? Or? Well, uh, yeah, I guess. Well, zoos are, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it, my take, and, and most people I know who work in zoos, in fact, at this meeting I was at, there were tons of zookeepers and zoo administrators, and with, with very few exceptions, they would like to be out of a job. They really would. But zoos aren't going away tomorrow. If, I mean, when I say if ever, maybe they will. There's a lot of people who are planning zoos for the future, you know, think, you know um, facilities like that. The zoo card is, is a tricky one, like I said. Because we probably all know someone who says, oh, when I went to the zoo, I learned that chimpanzees do this, or I learned that chimpanzees are endangered. Okay? I mean, maybe that's a great example. You know, they go and they see a member of an endangered species. But, but when I say they don't do it, it's like, like I'm an academic, right? So I like knowledge for knowledge's sake. You know, it's just nice to learn things. But the situation is so dire now that you need to put it into action. So one thing that, am I done? So, <laughs> well, we have lots of questions here. Um, so, so one way people have shown is good videos are very good, for, for example. Um, that would be an alternative. As an alternative. As an alternative. Zeus. I think what we should be doing now, and I think this was the consensus at this meeting, and it was really good because there were a lot of people who didn't agree with my views and the views of a number of people especially field workers, and I was you know, a field worker, is that we need to look at what's happening in zoos, like no more breeding. I wrote an article, the, the, the subtitle to the article is going to the zoo like shopping for a car was musical semen. Because what my friend Julie, who was at this meeting, came up with that term. What it really means is that one game zoos play is musical animals. The Denver Zoo does it all the time. They just transfer animals around their breeding machines. Okay? No more breeding. That would be a lesson to kids. You know, for, you see what I'm saying? So the animals who are there are there. They can't, there's no, there's nowhere for them to go. You know, it sounds great. Open the cages, say at the Denver Zoo, and the animal, all the animals will go into the street. No, it's just not gonna work that way. So set, eight zoos now have phased out elephant exhibits, for example. Ron Kagan was there, he's at the Detroit Zoo. The Detroit Zoo, Philadelphia Zoo, a lot of zoos, no more elephants, although they're very lucrative. There's a lesson there. See, you see what I'm saying? Kids go and say, why aren't there elephants? There aren't elephants there because elephants don't belong in the zoo. You can't give them their physical and social needs. I appreciated your comments about the need to kind of rewild the media and how sometimes the media presents this um, image of the animal nature and our own nature as necessarily nasty, brutal, and short, you know, kind of Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan has that whole perspective, and that's part of the world for sure, but there's that other part, say of Peter Kropotkin, mutual mm -hmm. aid, mm -hmm. the cooperation that goes on in the animal kingdom or animal kinship in our own. Um, so thank you for presenting this alternative perspective. And I was wondering 
Um, where, what parts of the media are you, you mentioned psychology today and eco-psychology. What, what are some of the other points in the media where you found some openings, um, some allies? Oh, not many. <laughs> yes Magazine, some of you might know that because yeah. I, I wrote for them, I've written some stuff for them. Yeah. You know, not many, and part of it is because of the rules of grammar. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I wrote to a friend, I, I know a number of people who write about animals for the New York Times, so well, I'm just a pain in their butt. No, I just, I am. So I just write to them, and Jim Gorman is one who writes a lot. I said, Jim, you know, you just referred to that chimpanzee that did or which did something. And really, they're following code. It's a, it's a revolutionary change within that industry because they're following codes of grammar. They'll go, the Chicago manual says animals are that's and it's. It's like this woman I sat next to on the plane. They're just following rules and stuff. So um, slowly but surely. So for example, you know, when Jane Goodall started her work, she named her chimpanzees, and she referred to them as he's and she's. And the, her mentors at Cambridge, University of Cambridge in England, said, you can't do that. And she said, well, if I can't do it, I'm not writing my thesis. So slowly but surely, so some of the journals in which I publish now will allow you to name animals. When I did, did years of coyote field work up in Wyoming, and there was Harry and Mary and Bernie and Seymour and Urban, you know, I named them a lot after my family members and stuff like that. And, and, and the journals wouldn't do it. And I said, no. I mean, we need this because when you number an animal, B21. So really, for convenience in the field, you know, sometimes B21 would be blue 21. You know, you have an air tag, something you just need it immediately, and stuff like that. But it's just saying no. So now, one of the things that's happened in a lot of professional journals in my field is they allow you to refer to animals by name. It makes a lot. I mean, most scientific papers are so dry, my God, you know, they're like sleep-inducing. When I want to go to sleep, sometimes I read some of my own papers, and I just go, God, who wrote this? <laughs> stuff. But when you start reading about Bernie the Coyote, I mean, seriously, you know, and like the wolves up in Yellowstone, they're numbered, but a lot of them are named. You remember them. You don't number your dog. I've never been to a dog park and somebody said, oh, this is my dog, F28. <laughs> God, I'm glad I'm not your dog. <laughs> um, that way. You know, in answer to Tom's question, another thing that really works, and I've seen this a lot because I like going to dog parks and watching dogs play, is having kids go out and watch dogs or watch companion animals and then say, well, they're mammals. Chimpanzees are mammals. Elephants are mammals. Mice, guinea pigs. That's another way. Um, I can tell you a way not to rewild your, uh, your introduce your children to the wild, whatever. I we raised a wolf hybrid, and so my daughter's sibling was this hybrid, <laughs> and they grew up together. But you know, I guess I don't really have a question, but I just and I I started reading your book, but I haven't gotten very far. But my dog looks just like your hybrid, uh, your wolf on the cover. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's setting examples. I mean, kids are the way to go. I do a lot of work with Jane Girl. I do a lot of work with her Roots and Shoots programs. There's other good kids programs too. Mm -hmm. Kids are the way to go. It really is. You know, another program that's really a great one, um, and I work with at the School of Social Work at DU. They have an Institute for Human Animal Connection. And so the really big field that's developing is conservation psychology is one in conservation social work. Every problem we have with non-human human animals is a social, social work problem. So at the School of Social Work, the most popular program is actually in the Institute of Human Animal Connection. Yeah. And you just mentioned the Roots and Shoots program. Um, do you still work at Boulder County Jail? With Roots and I do. Could you tell well, us about that? Oh yeah, um, I teach them animal behavior and part of the and conservation and part part of the program started when I went there. I went it first started in 1999. Oh my God, that's a scary thought, isn't it? Um, I went there and I said I'd like to volunteer to teach animal behavior and they laughed. 
you know, you have to get vetted, you know, that you just can't, walk, you, you just don't walk into the jail. It's a really popular, it's really, it's actually been very popular and I still do it. So one of the things I teach them is when things get rough there and they can, or gnarly, and they'll go, oh, you're just behaving like an animal, I'll say, oh, you just complimented him. <laughs> and that gets into a really good discussion. So what I do is I show them a video. This is a good question back to Tom's. I, I get really good videos. I've got an enormous library. I show them a video. That's their reward, if you will. But we have discussions. We had a great discussion about sustainability a couple of weeks ago. I'm writing a book about something called Secrets of the Dog Park. So I asked them <laughs> to give me questions about what they wanted to know about their dogs. It turns out that a lot of them who grew up in very dysfunctional homes, their best friends was a dog or a cat, in one case a monkey. But no, they're non-human animals. And what they'll tell you is the animals are their friends because they don't judge them and the animals trust them and stuff. So I love going there. I've written articles about them. They do great art. Um, one of the guys gave me a drawing he did of Fifi, one of Jane Goodall's favorite chimpanzees, and I submitted it to an art festival and it won. Thank God if he hasn't been back. You know, the recidivism rate is high. I just had a guy two weeks ago say, you remember me? <laughs> and I went, yeah, sort of. He said, I was in your class in 2005. <laughs> and I said, oh, have you been out? Oh, no. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it's a joke. The recidivism rate is high. But it's really remarkable. They, um, we did a book. Dale Peterson and I just gave Jane Goodall a book um, for her 80th birthday. We, had, we collected essays from all over the world. Some of the prisoners have essays in there and drawings. In fact, her, her greeting, the greeting card we gave her was drawn by one of the guys in the class. And she, I, it, it, I mean, she knows what they can do. She's worked with inmates. But it, it blew her mind. So that's what I do. You know, you just give them hope. I show them, show them this video called My Bionic Pet, which was a PBS special about animals being fitted with prosthetics. Um, and then they wrote essays about it. Um, but really, I, I, some, I, think, I think of the 10 best essays I've gotten from university students and the prisoners, two of the inmates have been in that top. I mean, beautiful prose. I mean, you know, and so what, it, what I like doing is it really gets rid of that stereotype. I mean, some of them have been in there for, they're in there forever for really nasty stuff. But they're, they're human beings. And in my eyes, they just deserve to be treated as human beings. I, that, you know, I get, I get a lot of crap from people saying, oh, why they did bad things? Why are you there? You know, why are you helping them with what they did? And I don't know. Maybe if they did something bad to me or someone else, they might, I, I, know, I know I wouldn't stop. But it's, it's amazing their insights into animal behavior. I mean, really, because some of them literally grew up, their best friend was a dog. That, it was, in a sense, it was the only constant being in their life, if you will, was their pet. Dad was gone, mom was gone, so, you know, so gone. Yeah. Do you have any ideas, anybody, for, you know, stuff I can do there, that would be great. But that's basically um, what I do. and. Oh, and they get so pissed off when a bear or an animal is shot around Boulder. Oh, God, they write, they write letters and I send them into the Division of Wild Death, I mean Wildlife. <laughs> um, I do a lot of work in China rescuing moon bears. In fact, one of the guys drew a moon bear that is used on the Animals Asia website. And another guy, there's a great group called Living with Wolves. It's out of Idaho. Jim Dutcher and his wife Jamie run it. They're both well-known photographers. He drew a wolf that went viral. I sent it to Jim. Jim put it on the Facebook page. The next week, a woman called the jail and wanted to hire this guy to do a portrait. I mean, I can't, I can't even put in words what it did for this guy. I mean, seriously. And so whenever I publish something by them, and I brought in the manuscript of the book, it'll be published in January, the book that we, that we gave Jane, you know, yeah. when I showed them the manuscript and they passed it around, I mean, we all would do that. Oh, look, there's my essay. Oh, look, there's my drawing. Seriously. 
And she wrote them, a per and she, what she does is she's so busy, she wrote them each a personal handwritten note thanking them for their contribution. And if you don't think that does something, and you never know where it's going to go. So my closing words, because I, I always say act locally, think globally. If you have a car, <laughs> go to the Puddle Car Wash. Puddle Car Wash is one of the only places in town that the highest felons. So I was there a couple of weeks ago, and there were five of the guys from my class working there. It's wonderful. Can you that? What's the name again? The Puddle? Puddle. Oh, Puddle. P-U-D. Uh. So I don't know. <laughs> it's spell checks for, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. The same spell check that turns who to it. <laughs> that was part of. But no, seriously, thanks. It's really the program is amazing, and you know some. You know, I'm rewilding the wild. That's what one of the guys last week said. Oh, you know, I brought them the book because they they'll read it, and they'll go, Oh, you're rewilding the wild. You know, stuff like that. So there's your example of lightness too. I mean, some of those guys are going to be in and out of jails and prisons. They have been, and they will forever. And there's some, there's some light out there. You know, one of the guys wrote a book and gave me the manuscript that I was playing with with the publisher and stuff like that. So there's always things you can do. So thanks for asking. It's really, I love going there. And I, I love leaving, to be quite frank with you, because <laughs> people say, oh, Boulder County Jail is just like a, you know, a golf club. No, 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 no. Jail <laughs> is jail. <laughs> You know, yeah, just read the paper. So. Anybody can close on a, how many animal activists are there here? Good. How many activists are there here? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming. I know it's cold out, and I'm glad to talk with you afterwards. But I really appreciate your braving the cold. Thank you. Everybody.